Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining this session and for just being part of this virtual experience with all of us from all over the world. My name is Raymond Pun. I'm the first year student success librarian in Fresno State, that's in California, in the United States. And so today I'm going to be talking about how do you design a first year information literacy program using Fresno State as a case study. So in a collaborative approach as well as a national conversation in designing information literacy to support our students mostly if they're in college, as well as maybe perhaps high school students or even other students in transition that could understand the importance of information literacy. And so this is going to be coming from a librarian's perspective, and hopefully this will give you some insights on how do you collaborate with other departments, other stakeholders to make a meaningful information literacy program across your community. So I'd like to thank the sponsors here, uh, Australia E-Series, as well as Blackboard Collaborate, The Learning Project, and Adult Learning Australia, and Broadband for Seniors. Thank you for supporting us, supporting this program, and hopefully everybody else here has had, had great experiences throughout the conference. And if you want to spend some time right now, this is an interesting map. You can pick one of those things and drag yourself um, into wherever you are. I'm going to do it right now. Um, and it is, for some reason, not letting me. Oh, there we go. Actually, I'll use this. Drag it out. I think I'm right here. Yeah, we're almost neighbors. We're, uh, it's right now 5 p.m. And so, oh, someone's from Australia. And uh, we have someone from Arizona. Very cool. So this is a really good understanding of where everyone is coming from. We may all have different learning environments. However, at the end of the day, we are all educators, very, very invested in supporting our students wherever we are. So I'm talking today about the Collaboratively Designing First Year Information Literacy Program in Fresno State. This is my information. So free to tweet me or um, email me later. If you have other questions, be happy to respond. If you have questions right now in the chat box, feel free to type them so I can also um, answer it since it's not overwhelming, overwhelmingly a lot of people. So again, today I'll be covering the concept of information literacy at a first year level, what to expect, what to look into, what is information literacy in the first year level, looking at the collaboration, partnership, and the idea of curriculum mapping. And then we'll be looking at some of the types of modules and tutorials and assessments and then additional resources that will be very, very helpful for all the attendees here as well as anyone listening because it will give you a better idea of how to use these resources to support your programming, whether it's information literacy, critical thinking, or any kind of a research-related course. So I just want to say here at Fresno State, um, some of the quick stats, we're located in the heart of Fresno, which is um, central California, very close to the Central Valley, and we are part of 23 campuses. So it is a huge system. However, Fresno State itself is really, really big because we have approximately 22,000 undergraduate students, and uh, in fall 2012, we have approximately three to 4,000 first year students. So that's a lot of students in this university. And as I said earlier, I am the first year student success librarian, so I support first year students. Not necessarily every single one of them I'll be able to meet or engage with. However, my work has to be sustainable and scalable to all freshmen, at least to all the stakeholders who are involved with first year students. Fresno State is also identified within the federal government in the United States as a Hispanic-serving institution and Asian-American, Native American, Public Islander-serving institution. So what that means is that the government of the U.S. has recognized Fresno State as an important institution that supports Hispanic students as well as Native Americans and Asian Americans because we have a huge population of diverse students, minorities from these backgrounds compared relatively to most universities. 
And most of our students um, at least are first generation, Hispanic, and Hmong background. So it's really, really diverse, and it's really interesting to work in an environment where a lot of students are coming from different backgrounds. So here's the library. Here's, this is exactly where I am right now at this minute talking to you, um, to people in Australia, to people in Arizona. And so it's funny. This is the Henry Mann Library. And in this library, we do a lot of interesting things. And it's a really nice image, too. So what we're going to talk about is what goes on in the library that can be expanded outside across campus. So when we talk about information literacy, we might have different kinds of definitions, ideas, or conceptions of what information literacy is. And so if you like, you can type in the chat box what you think information literacy is, and then we can sort of look into these definitions, and I'll be explaining how we look at information literacy at a national level. So skills for learning. And so information literacy is really interesting because being able to find information, um, those are good points. Um, if you can see right here, it is basically a set of abilities requiring individuals to recognize when information is needed and have the ability to locate, evaluate, and use effectively the needed information. This came from the American Library Association from 2001, which is the largest nonprofit professional association for library and information services and professionalism. And so because of this definition that has occurred in 2001, it has changed a lot since then. Now we have all these emerging technologies, we have all of these resources out there, we have MOOCs, and we have all of these things that can change and challenge how we see information literacy. Some people might call information literacy as digital literacy, which is a little bit different because digital literacy emphasizes using or understanding digital resources. Information literacy comprises of books, multimedia, and databases and research tools. So it's much more, it has much more flavor in terms of sets of resources. It's not just focused on digital resources. And so what's interesting is that in information literacy, there are these notions called threshold concepts. It's actually an idea in higher education where basically in the threshold concepts, there are tons of ways of understanding, thinking, and practicing in terms of what and how students learn. So I will talk a little bit about what they mean down the line, but I just want to mention that it is really, really unique because in the threshold concepts, in the teaching learning environment, we have to understand that there are things that students may learn um, differently or may not understand right away. So we need to be aware that the skills are, dif are understood differently. So for example, when we teach a, a workshop, there might be something within that workshop that integrates threshold concept where students might learn something new based on something they've done. There are a lot of different kinds of concepts within that idea. And I just wanted to leave it at that for now and get into um, the other area, which is the Association of College and Research Libraries. So that's ACRL, and basically the Association of College and Research Libraries is right under ALA. So they're part of the same division association, but it's a separate division. And they define information literacy as a set of integrated abilities, reflective discovery of information, how information is produced, valued, use of information and creation, new, new knowledge, participating ethically in communities of learning. So they are embedding the concepts, the threshold concepts that are out there within frameworks, within a cluster of these ideas, these talking points, these thinking points. They're basically frameworks for thinking in how we understand information literacy, as opposed to 2001, which looks more like standards, like is this, do they recognize, do they know when do they need it, do they know how to locate, evaluate, so it's different. And so in the Association of College and Research Libraries, the frameworks integrated with threshold concepts, here are basically the new framework that came out last spring. 
and it was under a lot of discussion, a lot of draft modes, and then here are they. I won't be going through all of them. However, I will say that part of the first year level, you want to consider some of them because you want to think about scaffolding. You want to think about ways to continuously build ideas over time and build the research skills that they need to know. So for instance, authority is construed and contextual. Well, what does authority mean? So is blog, a blog authoritative or is it a book authoritative? What makes a book authoritative? What about the context of Wikipedia? What makes Wikipedia authoritative or not? And when is it utilized? When should you use it? So there are a lot of interesting things because a blog can be authoritative if you are doing a lot of research on blogging and looking at this blog as a case study, just to give you an example. And then the former standards, I will say earlier, had much more clear standards. So information literacy defined, information literacy and technology, information higher ed, and so information literacy and pedagogy. That's right. Wikipedia is a great source to learn how to evaluate credible websites and information in their references and also really share knowledge and understand that any kind of content will have multiple perspectives. So that comes down to information creation as a process. So when people are creating information, creating Wikipedia resources, it's also a process um, because it's not a one-stop shop. You don't just do it and then it's over. It's actually, it actually has a continuous mode. And so um, as I said earlier, just go back for a second, that it's a little bit different. The former standards are now re-envisioned re into these framework for thinking where you might have to consider ways of being creative and adapting them, integrating them to your uh, teaching and research support in the library world, but also in your daily work as educators. So um, the first year part, that's right, if you're an elementary teacher, it's it's going to be interesting to try to integrate these. Um, I think some of them will make sense. Um, searching as strategic exploration. So if you have students searching through the internet, looking for what they need to find, and then they realize it's nothing but junk, you know, of course they have to really think, well, there's Google, there are ebook databases, there are newspaper databases. So there's a lot of different kinds of resources available. And as I said earlier, it takes a lot of effort to decide and really look at the types of framework available for first year students because not all of them will be appropriate. You want to think about scaffolding, you want to think about selecting a few and then building on the thinking modes, the skills involved. So now I'll talk about the collaboration, partnership, and curriculum mapping. I just want to mention that as the first year experience librarian, or first year student success librarian, I work closely with first year students, first year experience. And what we do is we work very closely with the writing center, with the first year writing program, which is basically a requirement for all first year students to take for one semester, and the first year communications program, which is another requirement for all students to take. And then we also have an academic preparation course called University One, where all of us work together um, in terms of deciding, understanding of information literacy. What do we mean when we talk about first year information literacy at Fresno State? So we've used, utilized the frameworks that were presented earlier and then adapted into our own learning outcomes and objectives, which I'll talk more about later. And so just to give you some idea, some of the best practices in to organize such meetings, um, here are some sort of L uh, key points. You want to create an information or an advisory group to serve as a user experience or focus group for, your, for a year, once a month. So they can give you feedback on the learning outcomes, your assessments, your ideas. You can get ideas from them. Really just sharing, creating that synergy. And if you have an agenda ready, you can always share it with them. Use Doodle, which is a really cool tool to figure out scheduling because it's always a nightmare to figure out where everybody is. So schedule ahead of time and then take minutes to share it. Yes, this group is voluntary and it's about, as I said, five people. So it's the first year um, writing, first year communication, the ac academic preparation course, the writing center, and two librarians, including myself. So it's about six, six people rather. And then you also want to um, take minutes and share them and basically make yourself accountable to this group. Make this group 
basically have an identity, a really strong agenda, a goal. And the goal is to achieve the learning outcomes, define the assessments, figure out the modules to support and sustain and scale to your students. You may or may not want to have group norms, so it depends. If your group is really huge and you have one dominant personality or, or voice, and there are a lot of personalities in these groups, not necessarily the one I'm in, but in general, committees, you might want to figure out what are appropriate and steps to get everybody on the same page in terms of being fair and allowing people to share their ideas thoughtfully and democratically. Isn't it better to have them from the beginning than to try to bring them in if you discover a problem? That's a good point. It's a hit or miss. Um, I think if you are just brought in, um, you can then talk about the group norms before you even have any meetings. And if they're uncomfortable with them, they can definitely consider not being part of it. Um, yeah. So one of the most important things is communication with your faculty, staff, with your community, people who are involved. I've been in committees where we also have students involved. We have to be very mindful of their schedules and then their work and then their limits because they're the ones really we're, we're just trying to serve and support, but they're the ones that are just constantly busy. So there are things you want to think about. And then so I'm going to be talking the types of modules and tutorials we've looked into. These are kind of interesting because we looked at several of them, and I'm just going to point out a few that might be of interest to you guys in terms of designing a research guide or research online tool for your schools or institutions. So here is one called Guide on the Side. It's free. It's available in Arizona, actually, same as you, Peggy. I don't know if you are familiar with this tool. Um, it is really cool. Here's a sample image of the left side, which is part of this um, pop-up demo. So you basically have to download it, create the questions, and then it will pop up on the side. And it's open source, meaning it's free, it gets updated, and anyone can use it use theirs, but also you can create your own, customize your own. If you have a school website and you need to have someone learn how to navigate to the web, they can, you can adapt guide on the side for it. However, one of the challenges is that it only works really well with computers. Um, so if you have tablets, I think it might not be so well. I could be wrong about that. And mobile devices, including phones, which can be a challenge. It's a really good tool if you want to just start on that. But if you want to just borrow some of the ones that are out there, just like this one, a Google Scholar one, you can uh, get the link and share it with maybe your students and then have them learn Google Scholar through Guide on the Side. So this is sort of an opportunity to um, explore. Here's another one. As I mentioned, you can use Google Forms. It's really, really cool to create assessment tools and library tutorials. It's also open source. It's free. You just might need a Gmail account, which is also free. And from there, you, you use the drive, the applications available. And then you can design your questions, and then you can basically have students use this website, this Google Form page, and then, and then sort of look through the research tutorials or databases in the library or outside or in the classroom to find what they need. So it's basically a survey program, too. That's great. I'm glad you guys are using Google Forms. I just thought I'd bring it up. Now, some of these purposes, of course, they may offer sustainable and scalable approach to support many library workshops in the first year program, at least in our experience. And I just want to mention that there's also Qualtrics, which is actually um, a subscription, you have to pay for it. It is a survey design program, and you can also manipulate it into a module. So we're sort of looking into that as well. You might want to consider a variety of options because you have different learners at all times. And so we may also want to get creative with these modules and tutorials and have maybe, for example, students use these tools first, and then when you have the class experience, you want to flip it, do a flip classroom where there are actually group activities that reinforce, emphasize what they've learned in the guide on the side or in the Google Forms, and then really develop and reinforce that deeper learning and thinking process for, their, for, for, for this research workshops or for anything. So unfortunately, I think, because I, I attended a workshop earlier this week on 
flip classroom and whether they work or not. It's half and half. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. You want to, if you put a lot of effort into it, maybe the students may not have done the online assignments and then it'll just be a little challenging from there. You will have to improvise. Sometimes it works really well because it's new information, you can integrate it and so forth. So it's, it has its um, plus and minuses. So we're going to cover the learning outcomes, goals, and assessments, at least from my experience in Fresno State. And this is something that we've been working on for quite some time since I joined in August. And I think it's important to have learning outcomes because it is basically, and learning goals, basically a way to focus your vision. What do you want students to get out of it? in terms of these learning outcomes. And then we're basing it off on the ACRL framework. So we've created some that is modeled with the ACRL framework, as well as the feedback from our advisory group. So that's, that group, again, consists of faculty from the writing program, communication program, and also librarians. So that way, we're integrating both feedbacks, both content, and then really focusing on what it is that students can get out of it. So we came up with a few learning objectives that considered the ACRL framework and feedback from the group. And I think it was such a great experience to really collaborate and share ideas and where are they coming from. And the Writing Center had some great ideas, the communication people had great ideas, and of course we were the ones that have to follow up and actually implement the modules. So here are just some sample concepts. So we only did two for first year programs. Do you use the understanding by design approach to planning, starting with the end in mind? No, I think we just had a big conversation first. What do we want students to get out of it? So they were serving our sounding board and focus group, and we looked at the ACRL frameworks, and then we came down to um, two ideas, and thank you for sharing that. Uh, ability to recognize information needs. So what does that mean? Well, here are the clusters of ideas. Thank you. That's a great point. I'll check into it um, after the presentation. Another area is finding, evaluating, and using resources effectively. So what do we mean when we say resources? Well, they're in the library, but what's available in the library? And sort of looking at how do they understand and know where to find different types of resources. So books, scholarly articles, popular articles, primary sources. And then the third part really is using the resources as evidence. So that falls down to intellectual property, plagiarism, citation. And really, um, these are just bare concepts. We think they meet everyone's needs across campus. It, when we create our modules and tutorials, they will be reflective in achieving these learning outcomes. And then we'll have to devise a way to assess and measure whether students can meet these two outcomes for first year programs. So what and how do we assess student learning? So there are a variety of them, multiple choices, true, false, free responses. And there's also reflective pieces as well as results and feedbacks from instructors. It's a little hard because there are many ways to evaluate and we want the students to do well. We want them to gain the skills they need. But we also want them to really understand the process. Um, it's, it's, a, it's really hard. Um, how do we quantify or qualify their learning experiences? I think that's a big, big question. Um, of course, the instructors, they all say after a library workshop, that's great, 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 but then they might get the papers and it might not be as reflective as what they had imagined. So assessment will be a challenge in the next phase. We're actually working on this right now. And uh, we are measuring the learning objectives to meet the framework as well as the university standards. So it all falls under student success and retention. And success is defined in so many ways, but retention for sure, because ensuring that they feel comfortable in utilizing the web and in finding information through a library, and hopefully maybe they won't feel conflicted in terms of feeling like they don't belong or there's no self-efficacy. So hopefully that broadens up some opportunities for them. So finally, I'm going to cover the last few parts that will be very interesting, additional resources and tools for your teaching needs. Um, this is kind of interesting. Oh, if they use their skills and knowledge effectively when they need it, that's the best. That's right. So it's sort of self-teaching and applying what you learned. So um, 
that's what we're trying to aim for. This site right here is free, Project Quora. It just released last fall. It is a community of online research assignments. I am a member. Anybody can be a contributor. There are blogs. People basically contribute research assignments, basically from the library. Oh, there is a typo. Oh, okay, I see. Your, your URL has a typo. And so in this website, um, you can actually find different kinds of assignments, whether it's about comics, whether it's about historical research, whether it's about communication studies or writing, uh, writing and research. They are all free and for you to use and peruse. It is a great way to share open access resource tools. I encourage everyone to look at it if you want some ideas, if you want to share it with your librarians, if you want to share it with your students or faculty. It's a good way to really build on research skills. And a lot of them do look into the assessment, the learning objectives, and also the ACRL frameworks, too. Here's another one from Bucknell University. And Bucknell University in the United States, they have a research guide on framework. Now, it will basically explain all the all the eight frameworks that I was talking about earlier, but I couldn't really get into because of the interest of time. Uh, what's interesting is that they have these posters. And now these posters, uh, this is, these are two examples here, will look into the types of questions you may want to consider asking. So first one here is authority is constructed and contextual. So you can print it out and share it with your students, or you can sort of use it as an inspiration guide. What are these questions? So the question is, how do you determine the credibility of a source? What makes a source authoritative? What point of view might be missing? Whose voice does the information represent? So these are things that you want to think about. If you want students to develop critical information literacy skills, you have them run searches, you have them find the sources, and then you have them ask themselves these questions. It's a really good exercise. Um, I wouldn't say it's the only one. There are so many other ones, and you can search Project Quora. However, it is one way to get them to start thinking about information critically and authoritatively, and within the framework of the Association of College and Research Libraries. And then the other one is scholarship as conversation. So here are the questions. Have you sought a variety of perspectives? What are the modes of discourse in your field? That's a little more advanced if you are teaching K-12, to but in terms of, I guess, theoretical discussions. So if you are doing something about gender studies, are you also looking at critical race theory? Are you also looking at colonial theory or post-colonial theory or feminist theories mostly? Do you have the information you need to cite your sources? So, um, oh, so going back to the um, modes of discourse, as I said, it relies heavily on the academic discussion. What are the themes within the framework of academic discipline? So as I said earlier, if you are in women's studies, what lens are you looking at? You have to be in your discipline. So if you're in history, are you looking at Marxism? Or if you're looking at a historical theory, or you using some sort of framework to understand your discussion. It's, it's, it's really for, um, or in English, literary criticism. So it's very specific lenses within your discourse. Who are ha who, what kind of scholarship is being produced? Who are having these conversations? And why are they having these conversations? And so the third question is, do you have the information you need to cite your sources? So what is it that you need or don't need that's, that is uh, lacking? What are the established authority structures that privilege certain voices and information? So who's having these conversations? Is it just scholars? And if they are scholars, what kind of scholars are they? Are we also including women? Are we also including people of color? Are we also including people in the socioeconomic, lower socioeconomic communities? So are, are they just a specific kind of group or class? So you have to think about the theoretical discussions being, ha being had on a subject within your area. Yeah, if you call your students scholars, that's really funny. Yeah, that's, that's a good way to encourage them to feel they are part of this community, this the intellectual community. So uh, I, I, you know, this is a really brief presentation to explore a case study of what we've been doing, what we plan to do, and what we've been using. So I appreciate all of you for just listening and being there and asking me questions. Um, and you are welcome to tweet me or ask 
email me, and we're, hap we're happy, to, uh, happy to respond. I tell them their job is learning, so we need to learn the skills for our job. That's right. How is it received by the freshmen? Well, that's a great question because it is still my, it hasn't been a year yet. It's only been eight months. And I think we've made a lot of progress because prior to my arrival, there was nothing. So all of this you've seen, it's all stuff we've been doing for the past eight months, in addition to everything else I've been doing. I mean, this isn't the only role I have in the university. Um, I also do a lot of outreach, programming, just general instruction, reference, virtual research. So if you see all of this, I think it's a good understanding of mapping out where you plan to go. And I also want to mention, I uh, unfortunately neglected to include this. Um, I will just cover this a, uh, just for a minute or so. Um, what I wanted to say, we also have, so there's collaboration and partnerships with different units. Um, I mentioned the writing program, writing center, et cetera. There's also this idea of curricula mapping. And I think I've neglected to include it because we are actually not at that stage yet. We have, so curricula mapping is a way to look into the types of classes. So if, you're, if you are in college setting, you have a lot of classes going out there. Which of the classes are you, are you are doing research papers? Which of them require library research? Which of them utilize research skills? And then you want to identify them. Identify these programs, these classes, and then reach out to these instructors and see if there's a way to include information literacy as part of a component for their program. Um, so there might be seminars in history or in women's studies, but there might be a workshop in um, STEM, which requires research. So your question is, is it optional for the freshmen or do they all participate? I think it would be great support for all the, of the other classes. So that's a great question. So the thing is, all the freshmen, they have to take first year writing and first year communication. So if they are already taking those classes, they are going to encounter these kinds of modules these kinds of um, information literacy tutorials that I was talking about. So it will cover all of them. So there's another question here. Um, do you think that skills could be taught specifically in high school or elementary schools? Yes, I think they can be taught specifically. I think if you really taught the basics, the difference between or among journal article, ebooks, a book, Newspaper, trade magazine, I think the format is really, really critical, as well as citation, plagiarism. I think if you focus on these areas, that's very, very um, a good start, and especially if you use the frameworks, just a few of them. Maybe um, the news, who is giving the news, do they have an agenda, what kind of authority do they have? So these are questions you want to ask, have the students think about it. So integrating this information in other courses is a great idea, but often those instructors are not willing to give up their time. That's right. So that's part of the curriculum mapping goal is to collaborate and meet with those instructors to ensure that they understand what your agenda is to promote information literacy. You can also just send them the um, online modules or tutorials if you have it ready, and they can have it optional to send it to their students or not. And if they do, great. So the students can do it, and then they can follow up with you. And so um, in, in the Australian curriculum, there are more opportunities for it now. They're basically research skills, and all ages benefit from that. I like the process. Well, thank you. I like it, too. It's just been really, really interesting to see how it's evolved and morphed into something that's now happening to be sustainable and scalable. We're still working on it closely. Uh, there are still a lot of areas to tweak, and I am working right now on the content on what we're going to put in the tutorial. So it's still work in progress. However, I think this presentation has, could share, could give you an idea of what kind of information literacy program can be developed collaboratively and in what context. So in terms of assessment, tutorials, outcomes, and what are the tools available right now. So I showed you a couple of them, the Project Quora. And uh, I think that will be a good start to use, as well as the posters. So um, it's a really great way to work with your librarians to discuss ways to expand information literacy. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I, I feel comfortable and confident that the university has given me this opportunity to work with them and, and really de de design something that is not necessarily innovative, because it's a huge need. Be, but rather something that is collaboratively um, sound and really, really um, core need of the university. 
So if there are no any questions uh, further, I want to extend my thanks to all of you, and please stay in touch. Love to meet one of you one day. I've been to Australia before. I've been to Arizona and wherever. I've been all over. But I, um, I ha I'm happy to uh, share more information if you have other questions. Thanks.